Greetings, music nerds, and welcome to Season 7 of the Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast. I'm your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in East Nashville, Tennessee. I'm so glad you've chosen to join me once again as we take some deep dives with a cast of wonderful musicians, producers, and engineers that I've managed to track down and speak to about making music, records, and just doing what they do in their lives and music. Don't forget there's a link to a playlist on Spotify and Apple Music with links to many of the songs we discuss on today's episode. You'll find links to those playlists in the show notes below or at our website. Meanwhile, the show continues to be largely listener supported. Your help in keeping the show going is always appreciated and you can do it with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription, which is a monthly payment of your choice. And when you sign up for Patreon, you get an ad-free version of the show to listen to, as well as getting entered to win a cunning prize pack from our sponsors at the end of the season. Or if you're tight for dough and you still want to help out, you can subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just by spreading the word, sharing the show, following us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and telling all your pals about it. You can get links to all this stuff at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, a huge thanks to the sponsors this season. Please check them out and let them know I sent you. They are Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resophonic Guitars, and The Henhouse Hang. All right, thanks so much to you for tuning in, and let's get down to it. Howdy, music nerds, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 152. And my guest this week is the unbelievably wicked guitar player and composer Julian Lage. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for returning. If you're a return listener, I sure appreciate you joining me this week. Uh, things are pretty good over this way. I've been finishing a bunch of projects, mostly mixing, I guess, which is um, oh so time consuming and oh so fun. I feel like mixing, even more than playing guitar or playing music in general, you really noticeably get better at it every time. Or I do, anyway. I feel like I do. I don't know if I do. I feel like I do. And that's kind of a weird experience because I don't always feel like that when I'm playing an instrument. And um, yeah, I've been mixing records now for 15 years, I guess, and I'm kind of getting dialed in there. Anyway, it's always fun to do. I guess for the most part, I'm mixing projects that I've recorded and or produced and engineered. But sometimes I just get asked in at the last minute to mix something I had nothing to do with up to that point. And that's always an interesting process too, sort of peeling back the layers of other people's work and seeing what's back there. It's kind of cool. So that's me for the next few weeks in between some gigs and some guitar and pedal steel sessions here in Nashville, which I'm always grateful for and enjoy doing. And uh, speaking of mixing, we've announced the Hen House Hang again for 2024 now, which will be in September of 24. But I'm also going to do another one in March that will be just focused on mixing because it's kind of an intense process. And I have no idea if people are going to be interested, but we're putting one on. We'll see what happens. So it's going to be a two-day thing over the weekend of March 23rd to 24th, six people max. And it's just going to be going in deep into the mixing process here at the Hen House. Uh, you can get info on that and the full-on Hen House Hang, which, like last year, will be a three-day event right here at the Hen House, recording with a full band and learning that side of it. So that's in September. The mixing one's in March. And you can get all the info at stevedawson.ca. So please check that out. What else is going on out there? Have you guys heard the new Stones record? It's pretty cool, actually. I dig it. But I have a theory about it that I've brought up to a couple people to uh, mixed reactions, let's say. My theory is that it's not actually Keith Richards playing on the new Stones album. I feel like I know his playing pretty deeply from listening to all the incarnations of, of the Stones and various Keith solo projects and seeing him play live a number of times. I just don't hear him on that record. I hear someone that sort of sounds like him, but it's so in tune and in time that it kind of rubs me the wrong way. I like my Stones to be greasy and rough around the edges, and this album is not that. They blast the big riffs right at your face, which makes you think you're hearing Keith, but it's all the little nuances and stuff aside from the big riffs that really make me think that it's not him. We'll probably never know. If I'm right, they'll take that secret with them to the grave, I'm sure. But that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it until someone can convince me otherwise. 
And just an update here on the end of season giveaway. Our good friends at Spectra 1964, who sponsor the show, have jumped into the fray with an offering of a giveaway of their insanely good BBDI. It's a DI for live or recording that's uh, really incredible sounding. I've got a couple here at the studio. I use them a ton and they're, they're really responsive and cool. So we're going to be giving the BBDI away from Spectra, plus three pedals from Union Tube and Transistor, and probably some other swag from some of the other sponsors, but I don't totally know yet. So the prizes are ramping up. And all you have to do to uh, be eligible is sign up to the Patreon for the show, help us out a bit with our overhead and expenses, and you get in on the prizes. So thanks to our sponsors for that. And specifically, thanks to a couple of um, new Patreon members this week who were generous enough to support the show, Kenny Schiff and Scott Rempel. Thanks, guys. That's much appreciated. All right, on to this week's show. Julian Lodge is truly a guitarist like no other. He's insanely creative, prolific. He has unbelievable technical facility, but also plays with incredible taste and tone and restraint. He grew up around the Bay Area of California and was a child prodigy who started getting noticed when he was just a tiny little kid, like six or seven years old kind of kid. There's a movie about him called Jules at Eight, and he played at the Grammys when he was 12, which is pretty nutty. And that's where Gary Burton, the incredible vibraphone player, heard him and asked him to join his band at 12 years old. So Julian ended up doing that and played with Gary for the better part of a decade. But he's also spent time uh, playing and collaborating with people like John Zorn, Nels Klein, Dave Douglas, Charles Lloyd, as well as on the bluegrass side of things with David Grisman and Chris Eldridge from the Punch Brothers. Julian's been releasing solo albums since 2009 and over the last year released a full-length album that's absolutely spectacular called View With A Room. And then some songs that were essentially outtakes from that album but took on kind of a life of their own came out more recently and that's called The Layers. And man, that is just an incredible album. Go check it out. Julian sort of rekindled my love for jazz guitar. I've sort of lost my interest in modern jazz guitar over the years. There's not a lot coming out that I'm super interested in aside from maybe like Bill Frizzell and John Schofield stuff like that here and there. Um, but Julian's records, man, they're knocking me out. He has this incredible trio now that I think is one of the great American ensembles, like right up there with the Miles Davis Quintet or the Buckaroos or the Texas Playboys or Keith Jarrett's great bands. I'd put them up there with any of those classic groups. So I would highly recommend all their albums as a trio. Julian's an incredible talent, very thoughtful human and musician. We had a great conversation about all these aspects of his career. And you can keep up with what he's up to over at julianlodge.com. And he seems to always be on tour these days, whether it's with the trio or a duo of some sort with somebody or solo shows or whatever he's up to, go see him play. So with that, enjoy my conversation with Julian Lodge. Well, thanks for doing this on on July 4th, man. I, I'm Canadian, so it's not like a, it's not much of a big deal for me. <laughs> no, it's, things are quiet here, too. Uh, yeah. Of course, my pleasure to be with you. I don't know if... I doubt New York goes as nutty as Nashville does, but that's where I am. Oh, and, uh, you're in Nashville? Yeah, I'm in East Nashville, and I think I think you lived close to me, and the, the only reason I know that is Christian Settlemeyer is a good buddy of mine. And he, oh, yeah, yeah. He, I, I remember him telling me at some point that either you lived in his house or that you were mm. rent, or he'd found yeah. you a place to rent or something. But. Yeah, yeah, it was great. We rented his, he had a place on Granada okay. uh, that we lived on. I'm sure he still has it. Uh, he does, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was lovely. It was like, oh, I send him my regards, please. When I you, will. Next time you speak to him. I will. I see him quite a bit. He moved here as he moved like he was living in South End sort of. And then he moved up just a couple blocks away from me here in uh, Five wow. Points, basically. So. Oh, that's so great. Oh, it's yeah. a beautiful area. It is. Yeah. So uh, actually, before we start, I just wanted to say yeah. that new Margaret Glaspie single. Oh, uh, yeah. Act Natural. That's insane. I just listened to it this morning. Oh, it's uh, great. Do you, do you have your mitts on that in some way? Are you playing on it? Or are you producing it? Or? No, no, no. Okay. I, but just... I, was, I was in the session. I was part of the yeah. session just being there. But uh, wait till you hear the whole record. It's just tremendous. It's the best. Yeah. Or do you play on some of the record? Or are you just, uh, no, no, it's you're smart, just a fan? Right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Cool. <laughs> we could, maybe we could launch in and talk a bit about the layers. Um, sure. For me, it, that's a, it's a really incredible record. And, and I might even be more drawn to it even than than what it's sort of yeah. spun out of. And I'd like to kind of understand 
where it came from and and like I know that it was from the same sessions as as um, view with the room and um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what separated those tracks out in your mind from them because yeah like sonically it's sort of like a half acoustic record almost I don't know if mm-hmm. you've if, if you sort of thought of it that way or, uh, but if you could maybe talk a little bit about the project in general and just sort of like yeah. what, the, what, what the hallmarks of those tunes are. Absolutely. Well, thank you, first of all, for um, saying that. I'm glad you, um, yeah, that it resonated with you. I like it too. I think it, I think it is weirdly uh, quite different for being conceived of as um, a whole body music uh, when I was writing for View with Room, I think, I think we settled on. I, 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 at least historically, I have a propensity for writing a lot of music and then narrowing it down. Mm-hmm. Um, writing duplicates of songs, you know, or triplicates. Like these are three ballads that serve a similar okay. function, but maybe have a different feature. Uh, and so the by the time we went to record, we had whittled it down to sixteen, and. Um, we did the whole record in about two days and listened back on the end of the second day. Um, And, you know, there's one conception that would say, yeah, this is a great record, but it's long. It's about, it'd be come out to about 75 minutes, you know? And for a while I played around with that idea of thinking like, I don't think any of this is extraneous because we've already Mm -hmm. done, we've already gone from 35 songs down to 16. So we've cut out a lot. Okay. Um, but as we sat with it, it, it seemed like two uh, narratives presented themselves. The one narrative um, is about these song songs, these kind of songs that are relatively short, three, four minutes, three, four and a half. Um, and there, there's kind of a story that's told between the three trio songs. Yeah. Um, and then the rest are which are with Frizzell. And there's just a, there's something about the the architecture of that music you know that that's very clear declarative here's the melody here's the solo here's the thing whatever here's the intro and what that left were these six songs that were uh less declarative and maybe a, a tad more ephemeral you know songs that kind of just ooze into being you know uh yep. a song like mantra or let every room sing and um i guess the real only real thing i remember was thinking that i don't want to um, utilize those more ephemeral songs as like a release valve for view with the room. Okay. So I didn't want it to feel like song, 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 here's our free piece. And here's song, song, song. <laughs> uh, Cause I, I've done that on records and, and there's a certain, that's a thing, but it, I, I felt like, well, it's not quite it for this. So taken as a six piece entity, um, it has its own con you know these songs portray a different picture like you said about half acoustic half electric totally incidental you know that just happened to be what those were but it was all the same session so um you said free were some of these free improv well i mean something like let every room singer mantra the the the, what the written material is you know tiny it's only a few seconds long okay Uh, so the red the majority of the piece is all improvised yeah okay um I'm trying to think of another one that's like that. The middle, whole middle of missing voices. I mean, again, that's a, that's a very short song. Yeah. But in the middle, there's this this kind of journey that that we all go on. So, um, yeah, I guess from my point of view, I think of them as having a bias towards group, uh, co- like free improvisation, mm-hmm. uh, with these melodies. You know, that kind of get us started. And when you were doing your composition, which I I actually wanted to talk to you about your the process of sure. composition and, and arranging sure. with your trio and all that as well. But um, were, did these feel like kind of odd ducks at the time or was that no. something that kind of evolved as the process went along? Yeah, it's no, it, they, they didn't. Uh, um, the, uh, the harmonically, melodically and architecturally, they're relatively similar. It's just, the vocabulary is, is rather holistic, you know, it's, mm-hmm. um, but isn't it so true though that songs kind of have they tell you know the music tells us what they need it's it's not for me to say really um but i do think we all took note of the fact that those six songs uh more so than being outliers were um just had these hard to define uh trajectories like Mm -hmm. each song has a beginning a middle and an end on the layers but not in an obvious way like like even like we were just talking about um where you have three of the pieces on the record are I think of as free improvisations with these uh, 
melodies at the beginning and the end. Um, you know, there were other takes of those pieces with different improvisations that didn't at all coalesce in that way. Right. Yeah. I bet. So, um, yeah, so there, absolutely. There's data that you get, I think, uh, only once you've lived through recording it. And then you can go, oh, wow, I thought this was this to, I thought this represented <laughs> something to that record. And in reality, yeah. it had a whole life of its own. So, so. What about a tune like Double Southpaw, which to me seems more composed and arranged? Yeah, you're right. You're um, right. Is it, or am I, am I? No, you're right. No, you're okay. 100% right. That's a tune. You know, it's a lead sheet kind of song. Yeah. I, I write with pencil and paper, pen and paper, um, pretty religiously. So I, I think of things in the size of the paper and then the, the, the disposition. So, you know, this, this, all the songs on this record were landscape charts. Oh, okay. You know, and when you write for me, at least writing landscape, um, yeah, there's a different perception of the architecture um, mm -hmm. uh, versus a lead sheet. You know, maybe with a the landscape, there's a more sense that, okay, this is a journey because you see the top left and the bottom right of the page and you can kind of follow this this essay, musical yeah. essay. Uh, and then there are lead sheet style songs that are usually up, you know, vertical and, and yeah. kind of like you'd see in a fake book. And those are songs to me that look like the way they sound when you look at the paper and they usually look more comfortable on a vertical piece of paper. Double South is kind of like that. It's like, okay. I think the structure is a one, a two B uh, with a little extension. And so I just remember that one laying, laying it out horizontally in landscape and thinking, yeah, this is more of a vertical song, but we'll just try it out. You know, <laughs> I love uh, that. That's cool. That's cool. And it's a bass feature, you know, I don't take a yeah. solo on its voice feature. So that's, yeah, each tune kind of has, has something distinguishing about it. Is that something that you bake into the um, composition end, or is that something that you're playing the tune and Jorge jumps in and you're like, yeah, that's what we're going to do? Or like, where where do those decisions get made? Who knows? I mean, I think it's both. In that case, I remember, you know, I, for one, it's acoustic and there's no drums. <clears throat> so, so that suddenly makes it a feature of the bass and the guitar. And since yeah. there's so much guitar on the record, I think it, organically became a feature for Jorge because Jorge is amazing. And it's, you know, why wouldn't you want to hear him featured? So uh, yeah. it's just so it, I do think there's a, there's a fair amount of um, seeing what the music requires, you know, and that, that one was kind of like that. However, the more we've played that tune, uh, it does lend itself well to the bass. Um, it really, it's, and it lends itself also to the way the guitar accompanies. I much, I'd rather be the accompanist on that tune from a guitaristic point of view than the soloist necessarily. Um, except okay. when we play it as a trio and then I think the, the, the bass solo makes less sense <clears throat> so you know things like that so is the fact that it came out as a duo with you and bass is that was yeah. that a, a decision that you made as a producer just saying like we're going to have this moment where the drums split or like if, you, yeah. if you've been doing the tune as a trio as well like what made you say well let's do this no, one as a duo we had tried it quartet with bill in rehearsal mm -hmm. we tried it trio and then jorge and i play a lot played a lot of that music duo probably the most most of that music was all rehearsed with just me and jorge okay. um margaret produced the record you know i and i very and very traditionally like i didn't i played the guitar on it <laughs> and i wrote the songs but I, a yeah. lot of those decisions were i i like not being so um i like i phrase it in the positive i i love being able to just show up and play yeah. and not have to keep zooming out to go is this right or is this relevant so at some point, presumably, um, we played a duo as we were rehearsing, and Margaret Bright said, sounds great. And Dave King, our drummer, said, sounds great. Um, so, he yeah, probably, again, quite He probably game. wanted a coffee at that point in the day or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, so, Mar so, yeah, I don't have the credits for this. So, Margaret is the producer of both records then, View with the Room. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and she did Squint as well. Okay. The previous Wicked. record we did for Blue Note. How's that working with your wife in the studio? Pretty great. It's obviously it's working amazing. for you. Well, I can't yeah. speak for anyone else's relationship, you know, so I don't know. But I, I, Mar Margaret's Margaret Glassby, you know, she's an incredible force of nature creatively. And so yes, she is. it's a privilege. And she's it's also she's not just my producer. She's producing, you know, Frizzell and Dave and Jorge and all of us. So she, her, her ability to look at the music and be... Uh, unimpressed by maybe any window dressings <laughs> is great because I think yeah. at the end of the day, she's one of the great storytellers. And if the songs are telling uh, a story or feel evocative, then we're on the right track. And if, if we're getting into the weeds about something that's, 
cool, but not the point. She's very comfortable saying, that's not the point, you know, try this mm-hmm. or try that. Um, so it's, it's fabulous. I mean, it's, that's, I've been, we've been lucky though, you know, we've been musical partners in crime for 15 years, better part of 15 years. So um, that's definitely at the root of our, our connection. That makes a huge difference when you, when you know yeah. somebody's music that deeply and yeah. you've got that musical c- connection that goes back, it's easier it's to true. communicate in the studio, I think. I think so. I, I, I feel very privileged to, to work with her. Yeah, cool. Both these two records are essentially your current trio, which is which I want to talk about like the the functionality of of the trio as a concept. But it's like the trio plus Frizzell. And I know you've kind of worked with him quite a bit now over the years. Mm. And I guess with him being back in New York, you probably yeah. see him fairly often. Um, tell me about how that came about. Was that like a suggestion by somebody or did it just happen naturally? Or did he just show up at the studio and say, okay, I'm here. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I, well, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it started with a discussion with uh-huh. Bill. Um, I had been thinking about how to expand the orchestration of the band, the trio without it really leaving the <sighs> intimacy of the trio. And Frizzell is the perfect choice, you know, as someone who is empathetic, masterful, can jump into a scenario and contribute, uh, but not take away attention from kind of the, the pillars of the, the music. Yeah. And so when he and I spoke about it, I was, I was rather apologetic because I said, you know, Bill, this is crazy. Like, you know, we've been playing a lot of duo together, a lot of stuff, um, a lot of Zorn records, myself and Bill and Gion Riley. We have a trio plays. I think we made six or so records of that in the last couple of years. Um, We've played in Charles Lloyd's band together. Um, we've played a lot, you know, and we both come from Jim Hall as far as kind of right. a, a mentor figure. Uh, so I, I, I was saying that to Bill or early eyes. I want you to be a part of this, but I, I feel weird because um, I don't, it's not a duo record. It's not, we're not really sparring partners. And he was much to my relief, very understanding. He said, no, I, I don't think we're going to, play autumn leaves duo or do our yeah. thing we're gonna it's your record and i'm gonna play rhythm basically and i was like that's that is what i'm looking for and so he said great i'll bring you know a telly a baritone a jazz master a j45 and these all these different guitars and we'll, we'll kind of set up a sonic realm so you can just kind of do what you do and i'll fill it out um and that's no small feat. It's incredible. So yeah. it, it started with that conversation. And then I had been writing with him in mind. And then we just rehearsed it the day before we recorded it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was at that time that we kind of dialed in which guitars made sense, where he enters, where he's out, you know, or just orchestration stuff, arranging stuff. Um, and also which songs he wouldn't play on. Like those three trio pieces where his omission is as much a sign of his musicality as the tunes yeah. he's playing because he said no i think um this only clutters it um you got it okay cool and then the next one be like no i think i could add something with baritone for example or whatever it might be so yeah it was it was a dialogue did that need much um input from you or margaret or was he pretty much right on was, the money no, he was he was right on he the knows money. what he's doing that guy he, he's the baddest bill <laughs> frizzell's the baddest he knew exactly. He knew exactly. And, and it's, it takes shape in the studio, as you know, well, it's like you, it's kind of like the theme of our conversation today is it that, that I'm noticing is you take your cues from the situation, you know, not from a, a necessarily a premeditated agenda. It's good to have an agenda, but it's also, mm-hmm. uh, at least with this record, you go, wow, the sum of the parts is something far greater than my imagination can really process. Yeah. Um, and it's, best that I let you know relinquish to that you know because Bill right. COVID things that I wouldn't have thought of at all and of I course think, I mean that's why you call Bill Frizzell I think if, if I could think of it I would do it myself so I, it's a celebration of surprise it's a celebration mm-hmm. of the unknown um and and I'm glad it was captured on tape yeah me too for yeah for me like he he embodies this thing where like I'm a guitar player as well, and I yes. had sort of tuned out guitar-based jazz for what, whatever that yeah. whatever that thing is. Yeah, I kind of yeah. lost interest in it, and any jazz that I was listening to wasn't really featuring the guitar for quite a 
quite a while. And then, sure. you know, my in, my interest in like modern jazz kind of waned and stuff until I heard the the Frizzell record that like freaked my mind out was the Tales from the Far Side. I don't know if you yeah. know that record, but of it's course, like the there's no drums or bass. It's just him, the horns, the horn players and stuff. And yeah, uh, or maybe there is a bass player. I can't remember, but there's no drums. It's like a very unique, crazy Special. record. Yeah, and that's when I kind of realized like, oh, I think I think the the idea of a jazz guitarist is coming back into my interest realm. <laughs> and then I, and then I heard, and then I heard your records and I had a, a similar kind of feel for you. Was he somebody that was like a, an influence? Like I know, I know you're much younger than him. So you would have been coming up through the ranks as he was already very established and had a huge catalog already. But was that oh, like yeah. a, a big thing for you? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, there, I don't remember ever a time in life of where I, at, at any, any age where I wasn't um, aware of Bill Frizzell, you know, it's like, it's like knowing who the, you know, that George Washington was the first president. You just kind of know these, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess. and so there was a time, yeah. the period where I was very aware of Bill, but I hadn't done the deep dive, you know, yeah. I was really little cause I was so on it. I was very um, obsessive about Jim Hall and, 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 and then, you know, quickly I became aware of Bill's actual, not only playing, but writing, you know, one of the great composers of our time, any time. Um, and, and then we became friends and then we started playing together. So it's, I, it's, there's a, there's something kind of surreal about yeah. it, you know? Um, but I, I, I really hear you. I, I, I am a jazz guitar nerd and I have been for since I was young and um, I have so much, uh, well, I just have a lot of empathy for exactly what you said, which is, um, jazz guitar centered music is it's like any kind of niche thing. It, it's, it's, it's hard to put all your eggs in that basket. Cause at the end of the day, it's forget the guitar, forget that it's jazz. Are you connecting with the music? You know, yeah. and, I, and I'll, um, the history of jazz guitar is so interesting because it's always been, um, kind of reflective, at least in jazz of, technological advancements you know it wasn't always jazz guitars banjos tenor banjo in the early dixieland bands and then the guitar became more popular and that was in the band and then electric guitar became popular then electricity came along yeah exactly and so it it kind of marks the history of of just culture you know guitar has an interesting way of reflecting culture at different areas spots like any instrument but i just happen to know more about or take more of an interest in guitar i guess um I'm sure the same could be said for drums and piano and horns and other instruments and obviously singing, but, but um, yeah, so the guitar is really, I do feel like it's, 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 it's what the person is saying and that's exciting. And I was just, just listening to Jimmy Bryant the other day again, oh, man. One with who I think is the greatest. Um, and, you know, just being struck by like, what a beautiful convergence of technology. Yep. You know, he's saying that he and Leo are kind of, working side by side and late forties, early fifties, kind of focusing on the quality of the telly and he's using it and he's on the radio and all these, they're using the tweet amps at the time and yada, yada, yada. And you just, and you, and the language is this kind of Southern bebop so country happening. thing. Right. And it's in, um, you know, the same time that bluegrass and bebop are both kind of thriving. Then you, a few years later, you have someone like Jimmy Bryant. Um, and it carries us through many decades of that. Anyway, I just heard that and thought, wow, what a beautiful uh, portrait of a t- of, of culture. You know, and when I hear him play guitar, I hear culture. I don't hear um, that's jazz guitar music. So yeah. I, I think the best hope is that things converge in such a way um, that you just experience a message. And hopefully that resonates. I love that. Jimmy Bryant sort of opens up this whole thing that I wanted to talk to you about, too, which is like your your current sound and and he was a telly player and i know that you primarily these days play the telly i don't know if that's correct or not but yeah yeah absolutely both these records seem almost completely telly to me but is that true it's funny those two records are all callings guitars i'm not playing any telly on those records but to tour those for that record yeah i played a lot i play a lot more telly these days mostly because it's a little easier to transport Less right. nervous about it, but yeah. but it, but that that yeah, the, all the electric on, of me uh, is this uh, Callings four seventy JL. It's a signature guitar that we made together, and it, it it's funny because it, it to me it's all neck pickup, yeah, and it's all Ron Ellis Ellisonic pickups, which are you know based on the design of a Dynasonic, like an old Gretsch. 
uh, but improved in many ways. And I do have a feeling that in a studio, that guitar captures what a telly sounds like live. Okay. Which is a That's weird a really thing to interesting. say. But, I, I, but it's like a yeah. translation issue. Often when I'm in the studio with a telly, I felt it doesn't sound like a telly as much. Whatever, you know. Weird. To me, I just kind of go, oh, I miss that thing that I feel when I'm on stage with it. So anyway, that guitar, uh, that kind of just, its bass line is a great kind of primitive electric sound. Um are you using flat wounds on it? It sounds flat wounds. Not at me. that time. I okay. use flat ones on a telly now. Yeah. To, it's it's like it's such a uh, what is it? It's like a snake eating its own tail. I mostly <laughs> use a telly with flat wounds now to sound like the four seventy with round wound sounded in the studio. And the reason I used that was because it sounded like my telly sounded before. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, it, we're talking nuances, but but it's roughly the same sonic profile. I mean and both guitars okay. do it just in different ways. And what about amps for you? Because like there is such a beautiful line that you hit with like, there is that breakup that, that for me just makes things sound so organic and wicked. Like I love the, the tone that you're getting. So that's the callings. And what do you use? You must be using low powered, like are you using tweeds or something to get that little edge of breakup? Yeah. I, I my amp for many years has been, uh, by a gentleman named Mike Moody, uh, has a company called Magic Amplifiers. And he makes just great amps in the kind of a, the style of our favorite old amps. The one I use is a Vibro Deluxe. It's, it's like a black panel deluxe, you know, okay. pretty much to spec. That's how the record was recorded. Then we went back and reamped it through a, I forget the year, 58, 59 champ, Tweed Champ. We have a couple. At, oh. um, uh, and so anytime you break up, it's just, that's blended into the deluxe. So it's basically a deluxe and a champ. Oh, so the deluxe you're using for the super clean, and then the champ is giving you a little bit of gnarl. It's and it's very, the, the amount of champ is very light. You know, yeah. it's 10, 15 percent of that, and it's not even okay. like a driven champ. It's only on. It's actually it's it's almost. I always think I, I I always I shouldn't say I always, but I, I often think about what um when I'm looking for crunch. I, I sometimes have to recalibrate and remember that. <clears throat> Excuse me. A, a mid-range boost in the right amount of compression can give the same impact mm -hmm. as actual grit. And I've been disappointed when I've tried overdrive pedals or things that are really great in, in and of themselves. But I, I kind of realize I don't. It's not actually the grit that I want. It's just the volatility. Yeah. Um, and I think compression, compression, and mid-range are what the champ adds. And then you put that in surround it with the deluxe sound and then you have you know that record is also all both those records were recorded in a one room with no headphones you know and really no very little baffling so it's a bit, tons of bleed so i think some of the volatility of the sound is that you're hearing the guitar through the drums you know you're hearing my okay. guitar through frizzell's sound or through the bass um so I, yeah the, and and i use this a couple of pedals i love this one pedal in particular it's called a big one b1g is how it's called and um it's kind of like an api preamp so it hits the front end of the amp just a little harder it's just a boost okay yeah um but it's always volatility you know i i, I am such an acoustic guitar player really like that's i think probably my most comfortable place but really um, totally i mean that's okay. what that's i, what I think that. was, but 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 that's the that's the profile i have in mind for um volatility you know you can mm -hmm. like drive an acoustic you play harder and the top can Sometimes it just collapses. Sometimes it kind of growls. Um, but that um, this notion that you're dealing with a chamber, like an actual chamber of this acoustic box and the pressure shifting and it informs how you play is what I'm looking for with an amp. It, the trouble is I don't play very loud. And if I did, it would probably make this easier because you get volatility sooner. Uh, yeah, so yeah. For, for us, it's always the trick of how do you say because I'm vol volatile when you're very quiet. Right. I mean, the amp, the deluxe is on like two. Okay. Very, so it's very, and that's, that it's not loud music because I have to be quiet enough to hear the bass acoustically. Of course. Yeah. So you're so, not using uh, monitors then? You're not getting no, bass in the monitor or anything like that? No, that's cool. No, not, yeah. not ever. What about uh, acoustic when you play live? Do you plug those in or do you just play into a mic? No, just play into a mic. And and no monitoring back of that? No, no. Well, so how, how, does, do how does your drummer hear you? Yeah, I don't know. He, I don't play. <laughs> we don't play very loud, you know. I mean, but we, he's we, not getting. Did. He's not getting any of you in a wedge or something. No. Whoa, man, that's crazy. 
I play loud, you know, when I play acoustic, I'm not a, I'm not a light player per se, comparatively. I mean, I, I, and, and the types of guitars I like to play acoustically are usually mahogany and they're kind of bitey, you know, there's kind of a snarl. So, um, but vol, vol, decibel is level is really a part of it. If you're not playing loud, I mean, we did these videos for the layers where we played the songs, uh, Devil's Up on, then we did the layers, that song and, you know, we're just set up closely, no monitors. I mean, He's barely touching the drums, Dave, and, and yeah. he, hears, he seems to hear me fine. Um, but uh, like at gigs too. Yeah. Okay. But also wow, keep cool. in mind though, if I were at a gig, right, and there's a big PA, and you're here, yeah, you're hearing it in the room, you know. So sure. it's I think the notion that it has to be directional in order for it to be va- kind of like uh, to register is maybe something we relinquish. You know, we're in a room yeah. and our sounds are bouncing around. It's kind of blurry, but we can see each other and it's fine. You know, there, there is, I'm not saying it's, I, it's, it couldn't be more refined, but, uh, um, well, it doesn't need to be more refined. I'm, just, way, fa- I'm just fascinated with the whole idea. It is. No, now that you say that, I think how weird that is, but I don't do, I don't play acoustically a, a lot live, you know, okay. but we've done them for recordings and, but guitars travel, mid range travels, you know, you can kind of, yeah. And it's if you don't have anything around you. I mean, if it was, God, if it was a quartet or a quintet or something, and there were horn, you definitely need some support. Something, but, yeah. But drums are kind of woody and, and papery, and the bass isn't loud, and the guitar is very pointy. So yeah, it's, I don't know. Somehow it works. That's cool. So I love getting into the setup, like the kind of the nerdy deets of the sessions. So. Yeah. For the for the last two records that obviously were done at the same time in the same place, were you in New York or were you in Nashville? I know you've done stuff at Sound Emporium. We've but. done plays, yeah, we've done a, did a record at Sound Emporium. Th- those records, uh, View Through Room and, and The Layers, were made in Brooklyn and okay. uh, at a studio called The Bridge in mm-hmm. Williamsburg. Great studio. And so you're all set up in one room. Yeah. Did you put the, were the amps in the room with you? Pro- yeah. I, I'd imagine, yeah. Yeah, um, just behind us. We're set up in like a circle, you know, with a, yeah. with a bunch of mics, tons of bleed. Right. My right. Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's something. I like, it's, it has a certain sound, which I think is good. It sure does. It's got a, yeah, it's one of the most like intimate, but also like really deep, like the depth. Mm. I mean, like the physical yeah, depth yeah, yeah. of the sound is like really remarkable. That's Mark Goodell. I mean, our engineer Mark is very special, oh, yeah. very, very special. And, 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 and he's a genius. Um, he really just is, and so his, his his he understands the meaning of the music and how that translates to his own um, capabilities, and he mm-hmm. marries the two. I mean, that's that's okay. we, we've we've long had a sense though that um, th- there needn't be any kind of puritanical agenda. Like it's it's not good because it's intimate, or it's not good because it's raw, or it's because it felt it's. It's a little bit of like, who cares if, if, if it either comes out of the speaker, or moves you or it doesn't. And yeah. that particular setup on that record d- succeeded, I think, in that respect where at least to me, I hear it and I go, yeah, that's what we're going for. We just made a record a month ago and it was wildly different. And everyone was in booths and it was more musicians and it was and that sounds great too so it's i, I think it just depends on the the, the 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 music really could we talk a little bit about your trio so uh you've worked with other trios but this one to me like i always think of great bands in yeah in mo in, in like the history of american recorded music and there's cer- certain bands that for me like really feel incredible like sort of like the stones do in a way but also yeah. like the big ones for me would be like uh, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, like that band, yeah. or Bob Wills, or like Coltrane's, one yeah. of some of Coltrane's stuff. Like, yeah. And and for me, your trio sort of has that thing of like creativity and like clearly has played a shit ton of gigs together. Yeah. <laughs> um, can wow. you tell me a bit about how you started playing with these guys? How long you've known them? What it feels to you that's special about this particular trio? Well, I have to first say thank you. With- for for um, just your for your kindness, I I I love this band, uh, Jorge Roder, and I go back probably fifteen years or so um, of playing together uh, in a band of my of my uh, mine from back when I was in college. We made a couple records, the Julian Lodge Group, uh, but then we also he joined Gary Burton's band when I was so we were in Gary's band together. Then we were both in Nels Klein's band together. We oh, do a I lot didn't of know that. Tour, okay. Duo touring, and then we were 
and John Zorn's new Masada Quartet together. So Hori and I are, and we've played. Are you the same age? No, roughly. He's he's just maybe I'd say seven or eight years older. Okay, is that right? I think so. Um, we didn't grow up together, obviously. We didn't grow up together, no. But yeah. we we've, we've been playing together a long time, and we we so we're. I feel very fortunate that we're kind of a team um, that 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 has had the the privilege of of playing a lot of different music together. Um, so it's not just me, the me show. It's like we're just musicians, you know. And we we're, we're, we have uh, we're we're soulmates on some level, and 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 that's means everything to me you know to share that with Jorge so the trio is the, you know that's he and I share the, the longest relationship in the, this band Dave King is someone bad I've been a, a, yeah bad plus his group yeah. bad plus and uh the trucking company and <clears throat> excuse me all these other bands he's been a part of um are things that I our bands I've been a fan of for as long even mm-hmm. longer you know the last 20 25 years we started playing together in the last I don't know sometime in the last decade <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh you know hit it off famously from the start and he's become this absolute force of nature extension of i think what jorge and i share um plus i think the combination of jorge and i plus dave equals something that is its own um has its own rhythm that has its own heartbeat and i think that's what we hear in the trio when we play we go wow this is kind of the convergence of all these relationships you know um, and just on a musical level, both Jorge and Dave are uh, are tremendous. You know, they're masterful at, on the, and their respective instruments. They're the greatest, and um, so it's it's very inspiring to play with them. And uh, I bet. And, and we we were we're we're lucky that we get to play together and, and to have made these records together. And I mean, it's it's a it's a real group effort. Do you find that it influences the way that you compose? Like, are you? writing yeah. music with those guys in particular in mind? Absolutely. I mean, down uh-huh. to the, what tempos do I, do they like to play? What feels do they like to play? What were, what would push them to something that I know they do, but maybe we don't do a lot. A hundred percent. The music's only there for them. You know, it's, it's, um, it's not like here are the tunes. Let me see who I can get to play them. It's like, it's, it's purely yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, which is so inspiring, you know. It's just so inspiring to have that opportunity. And you've had yeah. other trios too, like with Kenny Wallace and uh, I don't remember yeah. who the bass player was, but that was a cool trio too. Like, how, uh, how does it work for you, like as a as a band leader and a and yeah. a arranger with like working with different people? Like, what's the process of figuring out who you're going to be playing with, or does it just kind of happen because so and so is available and then it really clicks? Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure you 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 know this this dance very well um <laughs> that that it's about relationships you know yep. and you, you we, we're, if we're fortunate enough to be around the people we um have good relationships with then the the um the details of how to navigate the music often are are, are, are supported you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's not like how do i get this person to do what i want it's not really so so the trio with kenny wallison and scott Colley, for example is tremendous as it's completely different heartbeat yeah. and it moves differently and hopefully the music supports it um well, there was a period where it was with eric dube incredible drummer eric dube and then jorge roder that was fantastic there's a version with uh joey baron and oh really jorge yeah oh, cool. that, that's completely different it's mostly improvised music so I, these are all people that i love and and um so there, there's, I'd much rather play something easier, so to speak, that supports the, the, the relationships than kind of impose any compositional agenda. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't care. I don't, whatever, whatever, every, what sounds right. great playing, we should do. Yeah, the beauty yeah. of playing with David Jorge is I do feel it's, excuse me, I think it's the convergence of all the agendas. You know, we could go play free and be great. We could. We also have a shared compositional vocabulary, um, ha- having made several records together. In that that comes to life in a very specific way when we play it. So it definitely is the most complete picture musically of what I'm up to. Um, but it's 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 friendships. I know it sounds cliche, but it really no, just it play play with yeah. your friends. Play with your friends. Like play with play playing playing with people who you'd be thrilled to play with no matter what the music is. That's kind of been my mantra. And uh, I've been very lucky to to do that. That's a good mantra. I dig it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, when you like 
compose a piece and you bring it to the guys and you decide to make a record, how much do you work the stuff out? How much is it arranged? Do you like to road work stuff before you go Mm. into the studio? Or is it kind of like, okay, yeah. Ideally, if we can play a tour or at least a couple shows of the music, it's great just to get proportions in our heads like oh this this actually needs a longer bridge or this needs yeah you don't need this third section you know anything that that maybe made sense uh in isolation gets aired out if we get to play a show um I, one of those crazy virtues of the world you kind of you just self-reflect in a different way and you go oh no no this is way too slow <laughs> we need to speed <laughs> this up because we're you know yeah uh but but it's there's you know there there's sheets of paper no, nothing is longer than a page, maybe okay. two if it's if it's needed. But so we're not talking about compositions that are super um, dense. They're right. com- comparatively, you know, they're 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 they're. You do know, you write sketches not... of of bass lines and things, or do you just leave that open? You just give yeah, Jorge a, I, a, a chord chart kind of thing. It, it's chord chart, melody chart. We all have the same score, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I think the nature of our ensemble is that we like arranging and improvising and leaving room so it's the hardest thing like they say is to put the pencil down you know because you can keep mm-hmm. writing and 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 i just i as long you know what my friend was saying about some of my tunes he was playing them and he said it's weird They're, it's like they tend to be simple but there'll be this one detail that if you miss it you kind of <laughs> blow the whole thing I said, I think that's true, you know. So, so there is there, there's a design element that says like um, this is familiar, this is familiar, this is familiar. But this one thing um, we should tend to. It could be a change in tempo. It could be the type of improvising. I mean, that's the other thing. I think I think any song. It's not a given that a song has one way to solo on it. Mm-hmm. So I think part of the the uh, part of navigating the music when it's brand new is saying. Okay, when we get to the blowing, is it a free for all? Is it a right. more of guitar led? Is it more motivic development? Is it more harmonic? Is it more about reharmonization? Is it more of a rhythmic study? So, is that, I, does that get discussed, or do you sure. just okay? Yeah, we talk about it. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you have to play it first. I think then you know whether there's a discussion to be had or not. Um, but it, but at the end of the day, it's an improvising ensemble, and I do think improvising ensembles. The ones I love, they're they're very. They take a lot of care to understand what the kind of protocol is. It's not just mm-hmm. write the song, then play over changes, and then end the song. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at this point in history, there's been enough. You know, you take the Keith Jarrett Quartet and you listen to them playing mm-hmm. anything, but you know, a song like uh, the Wind Up, you mm-hmm. know, or my song, or and. Uh, what I'm struck with when I hear that is these are songs that could have been interpreted so many ways, but they're, they're, they're coming at them with a freedom. And that combined with the melodicism and the clarity of architecture is really this new alchemy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I think any song is, is, is a matter of, of, of alchemy. It's the song plus the disposition of the band, um, plus the, frankly, the interpretation Classical musicians are all we, you know, that we understand that that you interpret Bach or you interpret Chopin. You don't just mm-hmm. play the dots, you know. But it, the, the interpretation is our whole business too. You know, are we? Do you play this? Is this a kind of would this song benefit from a solo that's not so slick? You know, maybe it's more you stumbling and there's a vulnerability. Um, so sometimes songs really benefit from much longer solos. I remember when I was in Charles Lloyd's band more regularly, we were playing a lot. And he got his one critique of me that at least that he verbalized. Um, was so fantastic where he said, you're not playing long enough. And I kind of mistakenly thought it was um, a compliment, you know, like kind of like, no, I'm, I'm cool. Thank you, though. I'm glad you like what I would. And he's like, no, really, it t- we need you to playing a solo that's only a couple minutes is very, it's great that you can do it, but you're not breaking through that kind of other transcendent thing that only happens when you play long enough. Whoa. I thought, right. That's part of the, that's the interpretation, you know, it's, it's, it's 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 its own genre long form development it's 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 the difference between a novel and a short story and if you're out there to put out novels you you better write a novel you know so uh yeah. i just think those things are fascinating and anyway so it's not to take us off topic from your question but i do think it, in a way it's saying that those decisions are made collectively and they're made from an improvising 
and compositional point of view simultaneously. I understand. Um, That's cool. It's fun. What is your composition process? Like, I'm sure it's different and it probably varies a lot, as does anybody's. But do you have a general way of working? Like, do you hear something in your head and write down the changes and the notes? Or are you sitting there on the guitar farting around until something sounds wicked and then you start, like, kind of writing it down? Or, like, how do you write? Well, it's kind of... I like to record myself improvising a lot. And then if there... I often will transcribe things that I think sounded good and then maybe build a piece from that or modify it. I, I was so, ta- I felt it was so taboo to do that for a long time. I thought, well, no, no, once you, if you improvise it, you can't write it down. I don't know what, why I had held that notion to be true, but uh, for me, that's, that's in general, a good way to start play the guitar, record it. If something happens enticing, get, get to know it, you know, go, well, why did I like that? Well, maybe I liked it because I've, I like that key or I like that tempo or this one thing is really cool. And what if, and then the question, it's a series, it's a, it's a series of, you know, inquiries. What would come next? If this part is the thing, you know, what would, if that's the riff, what does it need? Well, maybe it could use a bridge. Okay. Here's a few different bridges. Um, I've said it before. And so I forgive me for repeating myself. Um, but I, I, years ago, I remember asking, it was just so profound. I asked Chick Corea once we were at a festival together. And I knew him somewhat well, not, 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 but I, we were around each other a lot, especially because I played so much with Gary Burton. They yeah. played so much together. But I got up the nerve to ask Chick if he had any composition advice. I said, do you have any advice for a composer? And he said, yes, which is the perfect answer. You don't, you want to hear someone say, I, I, I know exactly what to tell you. I mean, that alone, I was just like, you don't have to say anything else. I'm just yeah, glad exactly. someone knows just how to leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Glad you know what you're doing. Cause I don't get it. Um, I don't get how to do this for myself. He said a real simple thing. If you have a song you're working on and there's half a dozen ways to write the song. In other words, you have like a theme and a chord progression or just a theme or just a chord progression. And it occurs to you that it could be a ballad or it could be a blues, or you could lengthen and make it a 32 bar standard style song, or it's a finger picking song, whatever might occur to you. He said, write each of those versions and pick your favorite out of the versions. Um, and what was so powerful to me about that was I was doing the opposite. I would take a song, consider a way it could go, oh. and say, well, no, I need to write this song. So I can't have six things started. <laughs> yeah. And then once I started doing what he said, I thought, well, I'll write the blues version. Maybe the blues version doesn't have a motivic development, but we just kind of snap it into a 12-bar grid. You know, I say that, in, you know, casually, like if there's – it's. But but let's say we just roughly kind of are kind of rough around the edge. Okay, put this here, add this. That's your theme for the one and the four chord. What do you do with the five chord? Okay, it's very helpful to to get kind of get that out of your system and then go back and say, now I'm going to write the the gorgeous lament, you know, singer songwriter version of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that perspective, a lot of these things that I was talking about of improvising and writing them down is getting them on paper and then moving them around to make different versions so a lot of the songs that are on these records we're talking about today have so many iterations i mean these are those just happen so happen to be the renditions we put on a record but they're um do you ever go crazy like do you ever just like drive yourself nuts by like the endless opportunity or the endless like potential (laughs) directions you could go with something (laughs) no i'm not that smart smart i mean there are people who have that kind of like mozart brain where they can find you know endless possibility it, it's funny what i found is it, it's usually doesn't ex- my experience isn't that it's endless it's usually that there's a few itches that are trying to be scratched at any given mm-hmm. time musically and one song any one song could do it there's a song on this record that we just made where you know for a long time for i mean for like a year and a half i've been working on this song and for a long time it was the whole premise of the song was that it was kind of like a roy orbison um feel like a four four kind of like crying or love hurts or these covers okay. that of his i love yep. i was trying to write my own version of it and for about a year that's how i viewed it i kept tweaking the notes kind of well now this phrase sounds rushed when it's at this tempo but this tempo is the right tempo for that feel wow. i would add sections take it away and then you know two weeks before the session i said well, what if it's a waltz what if i just give that up 
And all of a sudden I thought, this is a great jazz waltz. And then the night before the session, I said, it's not a, that's works, but what if it were like a Aretha Franklin kind of six, eight, like a slow gospel six, eight. And that was my favorite version of it. But if you heard all three versions, they would sound like completely different songs. Yeah. Um, but that door is always open to, I, I try to be aware that it's always open that you can, you have a lot of parameters at play with a song. It's not just, I think sometimes there's a cultural notion that a, a great song is a great song is a great song. And I think there's a lot of subjectivity. It's all material is magnificent. It's part of the glory of nature and music and vibration. Okay. And so then what you do with it is really, you're, you're trying to get to know the context where in which it shines to you. Um, tempo, phrasing, volume level, orchestration, timbre, all these other things are very much part of the composition. And I, I, for many years, didn't believe that, you know, I thought, no, it's empirically satisfying because of these proportions. And um, I, I'm coming to appreciate that there's so much incomplete music I've written, incomplete by my standards, that I do try it on a different guitar and it, suddenly I don't have the totally same works. issues with it. And, and, uh -huh. kind of go, and that's okay. It's okay that it can be easy. You know, it can, it be, it can be okay to not struggle. And so I'm kind of learning that as a composer. Very interesting. Can you tell me a bit about playing with Gary Burton? Like you mentioned some of the other people that you've had a chance to play with. I would love to just hear about some of your experiences there and maybe, you know, like w any interesting things that you learned from him as a band leader or a composer. Like what a what an incredible experience. Yeah, right? I mean, Gary Burton is a legend, a true, yeah. true legend. And, and it, there's not really any, uh, there are no bounds to his influence uh on me or i think the culture at large i mean apart from being you know the leading proponent of you know master player of the vibraphone he is also one of the greatest band leaders one of the great mentors one of the great educators um one of the most fearless conceptual artists i mean if you look at his catalog one of the things that i in answer to your question that i feel like i've learned from gary is that he he didn't ever seem to be gripping onto a single identity you know he mm -hmm. much the way we think of someone like um frizzell or someone you know who's so true to themselves that really the excitement becomes w what other context can i hear them in and how does that shape and inform them i, uh, I always love that country record that he did in this in the late 60s the tennessee, tennessee firebird, firebird or whatever. oh yeah. man it's so happening it's amazing you know yeah. and but he would do that and then within a matter of years he was doing a tango record with astro piazzola totally. and then he was on all the joao gilberto stuff with san gets and then you know really driving uh kind of jazz jazz stuff and then his own band original quartet which was in kind of the earliest stages of fusion you know with electric rock guitar and yeah and 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 i mean it's 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 just profound so i think i look to gary as someone who was so um had, had embodies so much trust that if you come to the art and you take chances and you play actually play that you utilize your mastery and your your the, the, the skills that you develop in service of playing that you can you can open new doors uh and, and i think that's one of the beautiful um enigmas of gary is for as fluid and effortless and kind of rolling with it as Gary can be as a conceptual artist. Um, he's also the highest level virtuoso. And I think, right. I think virtuosity culturally speaking is it's a mixed bag. Sometimes it's um, conflated with tastelessness or, or um, one dimensionality, but I think true virtuosos, I think there is a, it's, it's, it's mastery that lead that allows for liberation but you it kind of does it the mastery doesn't really kick in unless you've used it for something beyond yourself and i think that's why when you hear rubenstein or martha argrich or heist or any of these you know the, the great great greats you know they almost disappear they're so masterful that they they're they vanish and all that's left are the embers of the music mm -hmm. um and so gary that's always been a thing i think i've pursued of let me try to do any homework i can so that I'm available to what's going on, actually, rather than getting caught up at the start line, you know, with abilities or concern about I don't I don't know enough. You know, I, I do feel. Were you a little bit terrified when you first started playing with him? Not at all. 
Okay. I mean, you know, at all. I was very, I mean, I always, when I first started with him, I thought, God, I sound great when I play with him. Like that's what I, and that's what great players <laughs> that's awesome. do. You know? Yeah. You kind of, it's like being around anyone who's great at their job. You it can raise your stock. Yeah. Um, so no. And also keep in mind, Gary was, I think our relationship is, is, is influenced by the fact that he was kind of a prodigious person as a young per, you know, when he was a child right. I and mean, he came out of vaudeville and it was a family situation. Really? Yeah, I did well, not yeah. know that. He, yeah, he oh. was. It was a very different thing, but but even when he was in his teens, he, you know, he was, you know, Chet Atkins gave him kind of his first big break, and he moved to Nashville, and he was working with um, Hank Garland. But the the point being, I, I think he, I think there's a there's a, a generosity of spirit he always afforded me. It wasn't like keep up with me, kid. It was kind of like I'm you, but at a different stage and it's all cool. And you too are invited to be yeah. this good. You know, that's, that was the sentiment I got from him. Um, and, and, and to, but I think anyone who knows Gary knows that about him, that he's, you know, here's this pillar of conceptual art and music, but he didn't do it by being a composer, which is kind of rare. The tunes he's written are incredible, but Gary throughout his whole career, collected songs from chick or pat or steve mm-hmm. swallow or carla or keith or ralph towner you know so he he he's almost has the disposition of a great producer and great producers often make the musicians feel their best and make them feel comfortable that's huge yeah it's not like he had a complex about his thing and you had to get on board with it it wasn't it's just it's it's not even his vibe you know um, <laughs> so that anyway gary's tremendous gary's the best that's amazing um, so you played with him for how many years? Very solidly from when I was 12 until I was about 22. You were playing, him, you were playing with him when you were 12? Yeah, I know. I started very young with him. That's bonkers. That's like, I, I don't even want to open that can of worms about like your mm. your early years. But like, uh, h- how does a 12-year-old end up getting a gig with Gary Burton in a nutshell? <laughs> In a nutshell, well, I don't know. I mean, I was on I, when I was a kid. I they they made this movie about me called Jules at Eight. It was this right. wonderful director, and it was but it was a college project. It was a senior year at Stanford. Mark Becker is the director. Um, anyway, that it, it's a funny movie because I was seven years old in it, and they found me because he was in the Bay Area. I was in the Bay Area. But he contacted my parents and said, um, "I'm just looking for a subject." And we've heard that your son plays music and my parents and I turned it down and he came back mm. six months later. And, Cause we thought there's, you have to keep in mind. It wasn't like I was, I was playing, but I wasn't forging a career. I was just a kid who happened to play a lot of guitar. Um, so he came back and said, no, I'd like to do this. And here I will do it. So if you ever saw the movie, I don't really play guitar. And I mean, there's a couple scenes where I'm practicing, but it's not an exhibition of my abilities. Uh, for whatever reason, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, it's just kind of about a kid. You know, when I see it, I go, oh, I, I know that kid. Um, <laughs> that got on PBS and then twice a year or so they would play it. Somebody at the Grammys saw that and they were putting together a kid band for the TV show. And uh, they called us and said, we saw this thing. And at this point now, that I'm 12 years old. I'm not seven years old. And I had been playing more professionally. And uh I did it. I played on TV. And anyway, Gary Burton was in the audience because he was up for a Grammy that year with Chick. Oh, wow. Okay. And he wrote me a letter. Wow. Old fashioned and said, I saw you and I was impressed. And would you play at the TED conference with me? And this was before the, the TED conference was always a big thing, but not, it was originally run by this, the guy who started Richard Saul Worm. And it wasn't, there weren't, it wasn't on YouTube. It wasn't podcast. It was really a meeting of the minds in this, in uh, this convention center in Monterey, California. And he said, they're doing an, a P, the, one of the themes this year is intergenerational, you know, something or other. Would you basically be my younger counterpart? Like, we'll, we'll put on a presentation. And uh, so I said, yeah, it was not far from where I grew up. And my parents, I went, I played one set with him. It was great. He said, well, that went so well. I was hoping it would. And if it went well, I was going to ask you to play on this cruise ship with me. And really? This was, yeah. So we played a week. <laughs> it was from New York to London. It was, wow. it was really wild. Uh, but it, they used to do this a lot. They still do it, but they used to do this jazz festival at sea uh, over through the Atlantic. Anyway, that week of gigs went great. Then he said, I think we should make a record. And so step by step, mm-hmm. I just was with him all the time. And as he would fashion new projects, I was involved. I, I was able to be involved in them. Um, I it was just kind of organically kept going. And then we, we, we worked a lot together. And it was, was that your most formative young ensemble playing? Or did you have your own band when you were like 10 as well? 
No, I never had my own band. When, the first person I ever, you can say, you know, it's not like discovered me, but the first, the person who put a lot of stock in me, uh, apart from my family and community was David Grisman. David Grisman, I met at a guitar show. I would have been about 11. Mm-hmm. And I was, again, the kid playing guitar in a town. That that was my whole, it wasn't like a, it just wasn't more than that to me, at least. Um, and David was the, so I'd like to record you. So he's the first person I recorded with um, is a duet. We did duet on a record called Dog Duos. And, um, that was your first recording experience? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, that was cool. the first time I recorded. Yeah. It was great. And, and I, and, uh, but, but no, I, I didn't have a band. I didn't have, I, I, I mean, truth of the matter is, I'm such a nerd for this stuff, you know, I, I'm a student. So I think at that age I was able to be, because I wasn't pursuing anything beyond uh, learning, I was just a student. I just studied, read all the books I could, took all the lessons I could, and uh, was surrounded by incredible kindness, you know, and nurturing energy. I mean, on a familial level and a, a community level. So um, I recognize that in today's world, that's, it's different and i i you know there was no youtube when i was growing up there was no there's yeah. none of that so i count my blessings that i i was i didn't really have to do anything other than uh be in hiding and work hard and and uh and and, and gary was a foil for me in the world because i didn't make my first record until i was 21 so from right. five until 21 i was really just someone who studied and played gigs with people that's a long time yeah that's cool that, a long time. Yes, yeah, so you're just kind of working on it, you know. So yeah. anyway, that that's it in a nutshell. Wow. And the bluegrass thing for you has that has that like that Mount Royal record you did with Critter is I love that record too. I saw you guys playing Thanks. at the City Winery here. Is that oh, something fun. that you've have you always explored that a little bit or like what's your what's your relationship with bluegrass? Well, I love bluegrass. I'm far from a bluegrass player, but I love I love the music as a fan. Yeah. And yeah, growing up around Grisman, you know, I was more in dog music land than I was bluegrass, but you know, I would go with David to go see Del McCurry when he's in town, or we'd go see, he'd take me to go see Bela and the bluegrass sessions when they'd come through town. So I was around mm-hmm. it, um, but but not like fully steeped in it by any stretch of the imagination. Playing with Critter, Chris Eldridge, who's such a master of that discipline, yeah. is, is, is a, you know, uh, is wonderful. Because again, like we spoke of earlier, um, that that is the sound of our friendship it's not because i'm a bluegrass guitar player or have totally. any inspiration so but we find middle ground with song forms and uh certain stylistic things that i do think lean more bluegrass and, and frankly just playing an acoustic guitar up to a single mic puts you in a different yeah space than jazz guitar and i think that has a gives the impression that there's a bias towards bluegrass like did you uh, ever did you ever sit down and study tony rice stuff at all or was that never really no, part of your vocabulary okay, no i cool. love i mean i would listen to tony rice records and love them but i wasn't i'm also uh, uh i i wasn't ever how do you say it i i don't i didn't wasn't terribly acquisitional you know when i was younger i didn't hear something go i gotta have it mm-hmm. which is weird um and looking back, because I think a lot for a lot of students, that's exactly how you learn. You transcribe and you metabolize. And um, but I, I, I would hear Tony Rice and be like, "That's so cool." And then the juice I'd get from just loving it would kind of fuel my studies of theory or you know jazz or whatever. But it's it's kind of like seeing um, you know a, a different medium of art and getting yeah, getting yeah. inspiration. I, I uh, and I'm not I'm not a great mimic either. I think there are players students who can actually start to get into embodying a player's style. And I, I'm terrible at that. I can't, I can't, <laughs> it, it's not even close. So um, hence, I, I think I just always had a very respectful, distant appreciation of bluegrass. Right. Um, but, but like we spoke of very briefly earlier, I mean, bluegrass and bebop, are, they were kind of developing around the same time in this country. So yep. there, you see a lot of similarities, you know, as far as music that, you know, perpetual motion music that deals with harmony at a fast rate, short forms. Yep. Um, you can, it's, it's not too hard to draw the parallels between maybe the studies I really was devoted to in jazz and what I see my friends in the bluegrass world really being devoted to there. Um, but at, at the end of the day, brother, as you know very well, the guitar is a beautiful um, connector and the guitar allows you to slip in between streams. Um, even when you have no business being in that stream, there's something kind of, 
endearing about yeah pick up a yeah. guitar it's gonna sound that way it's like whatever it's all it's all, <laughs> it all it, it, and, and i i don't say that with any disrespect i say with the utmost respect that i recognize when i'm a tourist and when i'm when i'm not and um, i think with bluegrass i'm a tourist but a very happy one well said um so i know you got to go here um i'm fascinated with your the fact that you're on blue note now is that something like going forward is that like a long-term thing that you foresee being a relationship and and oh, i'd love was, to was don was like a a mentor to you in some way with like signing to the label and just being part of that history oh it's i mean it's a huge honor don i i i only met Don within the last five or so years, but we uh-huh. hit it off famously. I'm a fan. I've been a fan of his for a long time. Um, and I knew his children because they went to a jazz camp that I taught out West. Um, right. So anyway, so I was kind of privy to him. And anytime I have friends of mine would be making records for Blue Note and Don was involved, I was I was like a fanboy. You know, I'd be like, what's yeah, yeah. Don like? What's he? What's he? I'd be like, oh, he's the greatest. You'll love him. So to sign with them, it came at a time where I was available to sign, leaving mm-hmm. one label in search of another. And, um, you know, we've made, I guess, three or so going on our fourth record together. So uh, it already feels like a long term, th- you know, I feel like they've invested mm-hmm. in me in a very sincere and pro- impactful, profound way. Um, I would love to keep going. I mean, Don, what Don represents to the community is huge. He's someone who truly gets it and supports music. And he also has the responsibility of uh, taking the label forward. And he does mm-hmm. that very elegantly and and uh it's him in conjunction with his team justin rachel this whole team that really day in day out works to make that label as great as it is and uh so yeah yeah, i'd be thrilled to keep going with them it it does feel uh like a healthy partnership um no i mean it seems that way yeah what's not to like you know yeah yeah it's a great fit well listen man thank you so much for uh for hanging out today and spending the time pleasure I really appreciate you taking the time and and such great uh, questions and and so much consideration is put into it. So thank you. I appreciate you. Well, thanks. What are those next to your pro acts? Is that a a speaker? Those black ones behind you? What is that? Yeah, they're atomics. Uh, Those look really, that look like like kind of old fashioned monitors. They look like old Altex. Yeah. It's um, this guy who he, he's from Detroit and he was uh, building power supplies for consoles and then he started building speakers and he died and left behind a finite amount of speakers. And these are some of them. But um, a lot of people around here have them. Um, Vance yeah. Powell has a pair and yeah. um, Dan Auerbach has a pair. And they're just, sure they have a subwoofer on the back that fires backwards. Interesting. And so it's all sort of like a self contained, oh. very cool. You know, they're the speakers I turn on when I'm tracking and everyone comes up to listen the atomics yeah. go on because it sounds That's huge cool. and and like really 3d and and loud and you know. wow yeah yeah totally <laughs> i love because i have the same pro x so i love that you have the others to go with it i can i can dig i, I can dig I did a record with Lee Townsend in the yeah. 90s and he had these pro x and ever since then i bought these like after working with him and um uh, I've used them on every, they're the speakers that I trust. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Totally. Well, I yeah. know Bill still uses those Prezel for everything and uh, naturally as extensively. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah. I had, it's my one nerdy question I had to ask you. <laughs> uh, right listen, on. I thanks for taking this time though. Really? Yeah. Thank you, Julian. I appreciate it, man. Best of luck. I'll see you around, huh? Okay. I hope so. Okay. Bye All brother. Right. Take care. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, everybody. Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast is produced at the Hen House Studio in East Nashville, Tennessee. Please remember to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can find more info on this episode, including show notes and an audio playlist for Spotify and Apple Music at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thank you again to our sponsors this season, Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resonator Guitars, and The Hen House Hang. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for another chilling episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. Over and out.